Uh, hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about generalized state channels. So at L4, we're working on an open framework for generalized state channels so that dev developers and users can get the benefits of this technology. So state channels in general are a way for us to move many processes off-chain while at the same time retaining the characteristic trustworthiness of an on-chain operation. For example, maintaining the, guarantee, maintaining the guarantee that your money won't be stolen. And by moving these things off-chain, we get uh, reduced fees and latency for the DAP users. So for today's presentation, I'm going to go through what uh, kind of the history of things, what already exists in the form of payment channels and application-specific state channels before talking, about, uh, before talking about generalized state channels and how we build on them. So let's get started. One of the original uh, use cases for blockchain technology is cryptocurrencies or value transfers between people. So let's go through a really quick review of how an on-chain value transfer, like an on-chain payment of Ether, looks like. So in this scenario, we have two people, Bob, a customer, and Alice, uh, a restaurant operator, both of whom have 10 Ether. And Bob wants to send one Ether to Alice. And we're going to go through how this works on-chain. So first of all, Bob sends a transaction, sending one Ether. The transaction gets picked up by a miner. And we wait for more and more miners to build on that chain. After enough miners have done that, Alice can send the poutine over to Bob. So already here, we can see some of the drawbacks of on-chain transactions. First of all, we have to pay transaction fees to the miner for every single transaction, that we, for every single payment that we want to make. So today, it's on, on the order of 10 cents, which is quite expensive. And in addition to that, we also have to wait for multiple, we also have to wait for the block confirmation time, which is on the order of a few minutes, at least. So that's a really bad user experience. So the question is, can we do better than this? And that is what payment channels try to do. Payment channels try to provide us with extremely cheap payments, or what are called micropayments. So we're going to go through the same example of, Alice, of, sorry, of Bob trying to pay Alice, but in the context of payment channels to demonstrate how they work. So again, we have Bob and Alice. And the first thing they do in this case is to create a new contract, is to create a special smart contract on the blockchain. Then they put their ether into the smart contract, and the smart contract records uh, how much money they have put in. Next, Bob decides to pay Alice one ETH. And what happens next is that both of them sign this, both of them sign this message containing the updated balance of what happened, uh, the updated balance. So updated balance in this case meaning that after one ETH is transferred, Bob should have nine remaining Ether and Alice should have a total of 11 Ether. So this message is signed off chain. It doesn't touch the blockchain at all and uh, it's a cryptographic signature. Once Alice has received this signed message, she can immediately go ahead and provide the poutine to Bob. So, Let's say we're, we've been using this um, payment channel for six months and we decide to close it. Let's see how that works. So looking at this um, series of messages, we see that Bob has paid Alice one Ether and then Bob has paid Alice one Ether again and then Alice has paid Bob seven Ether to get a final balance of Bob 15 Ether and Alice five Ether. And we also noticed that, we also noticed that um, if you can't see it, there is a, the se there's a sequence number for each of these messages that goes from sequence number one to sequence number two to sequence number three. For, and that's, to, uh, that's, to, that's part of the signed message and it represents which one of them is newer. So again, many payments have been exchanged and many signed messages exist. At this point, if both parties decide to finalize the contract, they can do so by both submitting the latest, cop the latest signed message to the chain and saying this is the latest state, in which case the smart contract immediately pays out according to the balance. If, however, only one party is willing to attest that uh, the, 
thing being submitted is the latest state, then the smart contract does accept this, but it waits for a challenge period to see if anyone has newer state. So in this case, uh, in this case, the newer state is 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 the one that was submitted. There is no message with sequence number four or higher, so the contract the challenge period uh, the the challenge period goes for uh, like no one is able to challenge it. So after the challenge period expires, then the contract pays out to Bob and Alice. So looking at this, how payment channels work, we can see so, uh, many advantages. For example, we got what we wanted in really cheap payments because we had zero on-chain transactions per payment. We need to have an uh, on-chain transaction to set up the payment channel, and we need one to close the payment channel. But in between, we do not need any transactions per additional payment. We also have this property of instant finality, where once Alice receives the signed message, she can immediately proceed to give Bob the poutine without, and, like, and that's a much better user experience. We also have a, a lot of privacy benefits because, if, because the only people who need to have copies of the signed message are Bob and, and Alice. And so no one else, in, no one else like no third party observer needs to know what kind, of pay, what, what kind of payments they are making to each other, how frequently they're paying, things like that. But however, they come with many disadvantages, and I'm really going through this because they carry over to state channels as well. So for one thing, we have a limited capacity. In the setup we, uh, that we went through, the maximum net payment that Bob can provide to Alice is 10 ETH. Furthermore, all parties have to check the blockchain once per challenge period to see if anyone has published stale state and then to respond to it, or they can pay someone else to do it for them. The underlying chain must also be available. So we have to defend against a case, or we have to plan for a case where, for example, the Ethereum chain is undergoing a DDoS attack and the gas fees are really high. And last of all, payment channels have a, must have a well-defined participant set. So in the example I went through, um, Bob can only pay Alice and Alice can only pay Bob through this payment channel. So now let's move on to what we call application-specific payment channels. And the idea here is that similar to how we channelized payments, we can use a really similar technique to channelize many other blockchain interactions. And I'm going to use the example of chess. And our players are going to be Karpov and Kasparov. And first, I'm going to go through the example of an uh, on-chain game of chess, uh, to, and then an example of an off-chain game of chess. So an on-chain game of chess. We have a contract here holding 20 ETH, so whoever wins this game gets 20 ETH. Um, the contract also has the state of the chessboard in its storage. So first, Karpov sends a transaction containing his move, E4, gets picked up by a miner, etc. And then the, um, the, con the contract updates its state. After that, Kasparov sends his move, gets picked up by a miner, updates the state and so on and so forth, until uh, at this point in the game, for example, Karpov resigns and the money gets awarded to Kasparov. So that was the on-chain version. Now let's look at the off-chain version of this. So the structure is kind of similar to payment channels in that we have some kind of contract on-chain holding the 20 ETH. And uh, we, we are going to send a lot of signed messages. So uh, these signed messages are, are going to be the state of the board. They have to be signed by Kasparov and Karpov, and they also have sequence numbers. So in this case, Karpov decides to play E4. So we sign a new message with the state of the chessboard after his move. Both of, both of them sign it, um, and that, that constitutes a move. And we keep doing this until the end of the game, and we're using a similar mechanism uh, the, the latest state can be submitted to the smart contract. So that's application-specific state channels. And now um, I, I move on to talking about generalized state channels. So what does generalized state channels mean? What does the word generalized mean in this context? Well, when in the app-specific state channel that 
I was going through just now, we had zero on-chain transactions for using the application. That is, for every chess move that was played, we do not need to submit an on-chain transaction. But when we want to generalize this state channels, uh, we, we want to continue having this property of zero transaction, zero on-chain transactions for using an application. But we also want zero on-chain transactions for installing new applications as well as moving funds in between applications. So I'm going to go through a, um, a kind of an example of a generalized state channel interactions between two people to, to, ex to, to go through what these three properties mean. And then after that, I'm going to uh, tell you how, how we do it. So generalized state channels. In this case, we have Karpov and Kasparov. They're playing a game of chess. Uh, the tag over there says the winner gets 20 ETH. And in addition to the game of chess they're playing, they also have a payment channel open where both of them have five die. So why do the two of them have a payment channel open? It's because Kasparov, it turns out, moonlights as a Tim Horan's manager. And he sells, he occasionally sells coffee. So um, sim similarly to, so uh, we update the balance to be two eight. Uh, it gets signed by both people. And then the coffee gets transferred. And we're just going to clean up the, the diagram so that we, o we only see the latest state here. So next, Karpov says, hey, there's this really cool game that I discovered called Go. Let's play it. Kasparov says, OK, but let's bet one die each. So the game of Go gets installed into their generalized state channel. And it gets funded by uh, with, by reducing their bal each of their balance of by one die and attaching this tag over there that says the winner gets two die. Um, so and then we ha exchange many messages to uh, to play the game of Go, ending up in this state. And Kasparov says he resigns, so the two die gets awarded to Karpov. So. In this entire example that I was going through, since it was a generalized state channel, there were no on-chain transactions. There were no on-chain transactions when the die was transferred for the coffee. There were no on-chain transactions when, when the game of Go was installed. And there were no on-chain transactions when they played the game of Go. So how is this possible? Uh, the thing we really need to solve is how to, how to kind of deploy contracts without on-chain transactions because playing the game of Go in a in an on-chain version is kind of kind of requires a new contract to be deployed. So that's why our technique for doing this is called counterfactual instantiation. And the the definition of counterfactual instantiation here is that we use incentives to make the parties act as though a contract is on-chain, even though the contract is not on-chain. So we call such contracts counterfactual. And in the example just now, the we would deploy a counterfactual contract which contains the logic for Go. The way we achieve this kind of incentives is by giving both parties the ability to put the counterfactual contract on the blockchain if they need to. So if you look at this structure of the argument, uh, it's really similar to, to channelized payments or channelized chess, where it goes, we use incentives to make parties act as though X by giving both parties the ability to do X. And in this case, X is deploy a new contract. So uh, for counterfactual instantiation, though, we have a unique problem. Because before Ethereum contracts are actually deployed on chain, we don't know for certain what their address is. So, but we need a way to refer to these contracts before they are deployed on chain. So the way we solve this problem is by a contract called the registry. And the registry maps what we call counterfactual addresses to deploy addresses. And this is analogous to how the Ethereum name service maps human readable addresses to deployed addresses. And the registry contract is global, which means that we only need one deployment of it to the Ethereum mainnet, for example, and all the state channels can share this one copy. So this is the kind of the, um, the API of the registry contract. We have the storage, which contains a mapping from counterfactual addresses to deploy addresses. And 
we have two public functions, one to look up the mapping and one to modify it. So let's replay the example from before and look in detail to how the registry allows us to solve the problem I mentioned. So Karpov says there's this cool contract called Go, let's play it. And what actually happens at this point? Well, they want to deploy this contract, they want to counterfactually instantiate this contract which contains the logic for Go. What that actually involves is this contract gets run through a compiler to produce some bytecode, and the bytecode gets placed in a message that gets signed, and the message says the counterfactual address of bytecode is 0x407e. Signed Karpov, signed Kasparov. So um, this, is a, this is a really important message. 0x407e is what we call the counterfactual address, and it's deterministically computed from the bytecode and from the signatories of the message. So because it's um, deterministically computed only from these, we know in advance what the counterfactual address is before, this before anything gets deployed. So once both parties have the signed message shown in red, we, consider, we can say that the contract has been counterfactually instantiated. And I'm going to now walk through why this is true. So we're gonna, we are going to have the registry over there. Um, in this case, the registry starts off, let's say, without anything in its storage. So, and we have this uh, special message over here. And anyone can submit this, anyone who has a copy of this message can submit it to the registry. And what the registry is going to do is it's going to check the signatures to see if they are correctly signed. And it's going to verify that the counterfactual address is cor uh, is correctly, has been correctly calculated. After that, it deploys the bytecode. It deploys the bytecode. And now at this point, we have an on-chain contract and we have a deployed address for it, 0x00be. Um, now the mapping from counterfactual address to deploy address gets placed in the storage of the registry. So now we, what we can do with this is we can have a third party contract that refers to this Go contract without w using only the counterfactual address. So in this piece of code, it only has the constant 0x407e, but since we run it through the registry, we are referring to, these co we are referring to this contract. And the important thing here is that um, the important thing here is that this this contract doesn't actually need to be. If you think about it, this one, the Go contract doesn't need to be deployed on chain for this logic to work out. If we had this third party contract and we had the special sign message, but we don't submit the special sign message to the registry, it still works out because we have the ability to to uh, we have the kind of the ability to deploy to send a message to the registry when we want to. So that's why we say that once we have a copy of the signed message, we, uh, the, the Go contract has been counterfactually instantiated. And that doesn't involve any on-chain operations. <laughs> so, but there's one more thing. The third party contract that I've been talking about, it itself can be a counterfactually instantiated contract. So what we get, what we get from this is that we can construct like this big graph of counterfactually instantiated contracts. So in this case, we have, a, we have some contract, we have a counterfactually instantiated contract looking at the counterfactually instantiated Go contract through counterfactual addressing. We can kind of build it to bigger and bigger pieces. So in the specific example of the state channel between Kasparov and Karpov, one way we might do it is to have a chess counterfactual a chess counterfactually instantiated contract and a Go counterfactually instantiated contract and a special payment channel that uses counterfactual addressing to look at both of them. So it will look at both of them to see who won the chess game, who won the Go game, or are they still in progress? And then what we have on chain is we can have, uh, the on -chain, we can have a contract on chain that refers to the special payment channel with the rule that if the special payment channel is finalized, which means that both Kasparov and Karpov agree that the latest state has been submitted or the challenge period has passed, then we pay out according to the balance of the special payment channel. So the nice thing, one nice thing about this is that the, the, the state deposit holder, so in this case, it's the, the thing that holds the 20 ETH and the 10 die. It doesn't, it doesn't need to have much logic. Like all the logic is over there in, 
in the dotted line. So a simple multi-signature wallet is enough to implement this functionality. So we can the, so in this case we will have a multi-signature wallet and a commitment to the multi-sig wallet signed by both Kasparov and Karpov that says if the special payment channel is finalized, pay out according to its balance. So this is why we call it an <laughs> object-oriented approach. We kind of built this state channel with all the functionality we want out of smaller pieces that refer to each other, uh, out of smaller pieces, and the pieces are counterfactually instantiated contracts. So this gives us a really modular way to build up any kind of state channel we want. And um, this approach also lets us have kind of really localized properties. For example, localized disputes. In, in this payment channel, ex um, in, in this state channel example, for, exa uh, for example, we see that we have an Ether payment channel, so the two people are sending Ether to each other. We have a payment channel for Augur reputation tokens, and we have a payment channel for maker tokens. And we also have a game of chess that's being played, and the winner will get the Ether. And we have an atomic swap application, which means that these two people can trade Ether for Augur reputation tokens trustlessly with each other inside the state channel. And the localized disputes means that if, if we have a dispute about chess, we can bring it on chain. But if we have a dispute about chess but no dispute about atomic swap, we can just put the chess uh, contracts on chain and we don't need to put the atomic swap contract on chain. So that comes out of the really localized property of the object-oriented approach. Coming back to what I said just now, the only on-chain component of a state channel is the multi-signature wallet. So this allows us to minimize the amount of code that needs to be deployed on-chain because a multi-sig wallet is not many lines of code. You can, you can write it in a, like a really short way. And this also gives us a re really nice privacy benefits because an external observer cannot distinguish a normal multi-sig from a multi-sig that's being used as part of a state channel. So looking at this multi-sig, I don't know if Liam and Jeff are just having a normal multi-sig or if they are having a, or if they have a state channel going on between them, so that really improves privacy. So, going through all the constructions for generalized state channels, we show you how to use a channelized application, how to install new applications, and how to move funds between applications, all with zero on-chain transactions, and that's something I think is really cool about about generalized state channels. So now let's move on to talking about state channels in context. So we, uh, we kind of get this question a lot from people about how state channels fit in with other things they have the, um, people have heard about. So in general, state channels are, part, are a layer two solution, which is a category of things that includes Plasma, Sidechain, Truebit, and other things. And you can visit this link to read an in-depth article about these layer two solutions. And all of the layer two solutions have different trade-offs between them. And one common, question, one common thing people want us to compare it against is specifically Plasma. So let's compare it to Plasma. State channels can do instant withdrawals if both parties agree that the latest state has been submitted, which you, can do in which you cannot do in Plasma. State channels should be less expensive than Plasma and have faster time to finality. However, the trade-off is that Plasma does not require defined participant set whereas state channels do. So for example, you cannot offer a bounty inside a state channel because that does not have a defined participant set. So because, kind of because these two techniques are complementary, we expect that they will be used together to, um, to get the best of both worlds. So what can happen is uh, we, we, can, we will probably have the base Ethereum chain and then we are going to build plasma chains on top of that and then we have state channels built on top of the plasma chains. And this is possible because state channels work on, uh, state channels work on any base chain that it has during complete smart contracts. So by building things in this way, we can have channelized applications run really, really cheaply and quickly. And if you have an application that cannot be channelized, like a bounty, it can run on the plasma chain. So it's slightly more expensive. So, um, now I'm going to talk about the next steps of what L4 is doing. So what we are doing right now is uh, we're writing a paper to explain um, 
everything I just told you about and more, describing our approach in more detail, and accompanying, accompanying that paper is a proof of concept that we call minimal viable state channel. And at the same time, we're building a team to accelerate our research and development efforts. After the paper and the proof of concept have been released, we intend to do more research into better designs of uh, better designs of generalized state channels, as well as supporting services necessary, and to build a framework with kind of really optimized code, formally verified code, and client libraries. And with this framework, we can work with projects to integrate their decentralized applications into this paradigm of generalized state channels. So how can you get involved if you are already using state channels in your DAP? The benefit for integrating with our framework is that you can share in the ecosystem of channelized applications. So uh, if you, if you in, if kind of integrate into this, your users can install your channelized application and move funds into it without any on-chain transactions. So that's something really nice for your users. If you're building an existing dApp that doesn't have state channels, um, I hope this talk has given you enough information to think about what functionality you can what functionality in your DAP can be moved off-chain. So for example, the parts that have well-defined participant sets. And some applications of state channels that we've seen in existing projects include micropayments, auctions, market players, and two-player games. If you're someone who's just looking for difficult research problems, really interesting research problems, we have plenty of them. This is just a small selection of them. Uh, we, we, uh, we have really interesting research problems about routing over non-fungible assets, kind of like building a, um, building a channel with someone where you don't have a direct connection with them, but going through intermediaries. We have research problems into insurance providers, which are the parties, the third parties that watch the chain for old data on your behalf. And um, there's also really interesting work to be done in formalizing the trade-offs between side chains, plasma, state channels, et cetera. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Does anyone have questions? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, could you speak up a bit? Right, so the question was, um, what, how do the participant set of the multi-sig inter interact with the participant set of the state channels, right? So in, in this um, approach we've described, um, the parties of the state channel are, have, to have to create a multi-sig wallet between them. So if you, you want to run a state channel between three people, you will create a multi-sig wallet with those three people. Um, yes. Hello. Oh, hello. Um, yeah, so my question goes to when you're talking about generalized state channels, it seems as if you're essentially moving, you move as many transactions off the chain as possible. Um, just thinking about it, it seems as if, like, if you have all of these transactions off the chain, wouldn't you, or what are the trade offs? Wouldn't you run into issues when large batches are, of transactions are counterfactually instantiated and decided to be put back on the chain? Uh, yeah, so that's one of the uh, disadvantages that I mentioned about uh, payment channels. So we do have to worry about if, too, if there are too many people trying to withdraw, trying to kind of settle, a, uh, settle different state channels on chain at the same time, then um, we, can have like a, uh, we can have like an attacker like DDoS the Ethereum chain and, and drag and prevent them from closing out the state channels. So that is, uh, that is an important problem. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm kind of new to this whole scaling. Um, my question is, I see a lot of computation being moved off chain, which makes a lot of sense. Um, but how, what's the incentive for running that computation? Like, is this happening in some kind of node that's going to be rewarded somehow? Or, yeah, what, what's the idea there? Uh, right, so um, in the specific case of uh, state channels, the parties running the computations are exactly the ones who are involved in it. So, for example, when 
uh, Karpov and Kasparov had a state channel between them. The only people who need to check the check, like for example, is E1 a valid move? Is uh, Karpov and Kasparov? That's the only two people. Okay. okay, so validation is only with the parties that are involved. Yeah, within the part. Okay, all right, thanks. So, like, if you if both of you sign like a ridiculous invalid state transaction, that's on that's that's on both of you. Oh, uh, I guess it's time, right? Uh, yeah, so uh, visit statechannels.org to learn more. Uh, thank you.